It's uh, an overview of six decades of Caro's work. It's broadly chronological. It begins in the mid-1960s and goes right through to the, to the final work, almost, that Tony was making in 2013 when he, when he died. And you can follow the, the development of his unique abstract language. But I also wanted to focus on a theme. I wanted to kind of tease out what the work is really about. And in that respect, the idea of presence is, is central. The idea of having an encounter with sculpture, an emotional encounter in which the, 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 the sculpture has a personality that it projects and you respond to that and have an emotional response. That's really key to understanding Caro's work. It begins in the top floor of the, the space um, with a, a sculpture called First National, which was made in 1964. And that's really the beginning of the story. That's the, that's the story of Caro's abstract work. And that work is important because it follows the moment in 1963, the year previously, when everything changed. It was the first time that Caro's abstract work had been seen in London at the Whitechapel Gallery, and um, it's the, I think, the moment when sculpture changed irreversibly. Caro showed for the first time these astonishing works, abstract sculptures in brightly painted colours, which were not, nothing like anything that had ever been seen before. These extraordinary objects, which were steel and open, and some of them looked as though they were floating and they were going along the ground, and people thought, well, what are they? Some people even thought, are they sculpture? They, they, weren't, they weren't sure. Caro said, all art is about what it's like to be alive. And that's a really key idea. It's the idea of being in the world, occupying a body, an expressive body, having sensations and feelings and emotions and gesturing. And it's about responding to other people in their bodies and you having a response to that. And that's really Caro's subject. If you look at the works in the, in the 1950s, he did it in quite a literal way. He made figures, lumpen figures in clay, and they're all about being in the body. They're, they're performing actions like stretching and lifting and moving and twisting and turning. They're all about physical sensations, and it's, they're very physical. They're very in the world. But they are also, I think, what Tony came to feel were illustrative. So he wanted to get rid of that. He became very dissatisfied with it in the late 50s. And he wanted something that was more real, he said, more real and more felt. And then famously he went to America and he met Kenneth Noland and other abstract painters, uh, Helen Frankenthaler, who were engaging with similar issues. How to make art that was real in itself, not pretend that had a real emotional engagement and projection. The dialogue um, about how to develop the language of abstraction really gained in, in momentum at that point. And he came back to London in 1960 and he made his first abstract sculpture and everything changed. All of the modeling, all of the clay, all of the heavy figures uh, went away and he replaced it with scrap steel with welding, open structures, and the method changed. Everything was constructed, added to, assembled like a, like a, a three-dimensional collage. What he did at that point was to take up the idea about what would sculpture look like if you started not adding to it, but taking things away, removing the materials of sculpture, not making it complicated, but making it very simple and minimal. How far back can you strip the materials of the sculpture before it ceases to be a sculpture? And that's really what was happening in the so-called naked, so that's what he called them, the naked sculptures, uh, such as the, um, where he's taking 
the materials away, he's purring it back, and he's exploring how minimal, how absolutely purred back to the bone the sculpture can be and still be expressive, still have a presence. And all the baggage, all the paraphernalia, all the fussiness of sculpture drops away. And he's seeing how essential you can make sculpture. One of the things that caught people's attention in the 60s was, of course, his decision to paint the, the, uh, the sculptures. And he painted them all these extraordinary colours, reds and greens and yellows and, and blues and so on. And partly that was to do with making a break with marble and all of the traditional appearance of sculpture. He wanted it to be modern, industrial and so on. But it was also very functional. Um, one of the things he realised was that if you make sculpture in this assembled way, it could end up looking all very various. But if you paint it a unifying colour, it brings it all together and gives it a definite identity. While that defines his work in the 60s, there was a big change in 1970. And everything changed again. And he finished with colour. He, he stopped it. And the reason for that, I think, was because in 1969, the uh, American critic, Hilton Kramer, said, responding to Caro's exhibition in New York, he said, Caro is the leading artist of his generation. He's achieved a degree of refinement in his work. And he was looking at works like Larry's Land and the London works that are in this exhibition and saying how refined, how elegant they appear, how lyrical, how um, seductive they are. He meant it as a tribute, but Caro was horrified. He didn't want his work to be elegant and refined. He didn't want it to be ingratiating and seductive. He wanted it to be tough and edgy and challenging and abrasive and everything that colour now seemed to be mitigating. So he changed his ways again. After 10 years of working with colour, he banished it and he went back to working with steel with these raw, haptic qualities of the, the raw steel. Tony was a great improviser. He was actually working in a very small one-car garage at his home in Hampstead, North London. And it was a very confined space. And as ever, the beginning of each, each sculpture was not an idea, it was the materials. And his materials were invariably, in the first instance in the 50s, it was clay. But in the 60s, it was, it was found scrap steel that he'd discovered in, in scrap yards. And he brought them all back to his house and they'd lie around in the courtyard and he'd look at them and live with them and think about them and be interested by them. And at some point there, you would take them into the uh, garage and begin to play with them begin to explore them and try to feel their emotional characteristics, their expressiveness and put things together. And he would improvise, he would try that arrangement and it might be nothing. But then he would try something else, he'd turn it upside down and he would think, yes, that's interesting. And in a way, he started to behave a bit like a painter, where you take a canvas and it's blank and you put a brush mark on it and you think, hmm, possible. You add something and it begins to gain uh, a presence. It begins to grow an identity and that's what he was doing. But what was really interesting was he was very close to it. It was in such a small space. It was a bit like Jackson Pollock. He was in the work, just as Pollock was in the painting. He wasn't standing back and composing it. He said this to me, he, he was very clear about it. He didn't want to compose. He wanted to be in it and to grow it and to have a very direct improvised relationship with the materials and let the thing come of its own accord almost. So that when he took it outside, 
of the garage into the, to the courtyard, he'd look at it and he would discover what he'd done. And at that point, of course, it might be nothing. Or it might be some mysterious presence had come into existence. And that's when the sculptures really began to catch light. That's, 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 that's when it all happened. The plinth, the pedestal, which is a kind of imaginative space, it's a bit like a frame around a picture. It kind of draws a line around this imaginative space which is occupied by the work of art. And he wanted to get rid of that. He wanted the, the work to come off the imaginative space and into your space. So if he was going to create smaller works, how do you present them? He, he addressed this in 1966. How do you make smaller sculpture that is back on the pedestal without making it look like a maquette, without making it look like a model for a larger sculpture? And his solution was entirely innovatory. Nothing like it ever been seen before. Um, astonishing. He uh, placed the sculpture on the plinth, on the pedestal, but it jumps off it. It comes off the plinth and back into your space. It, it creeps down or jumps off the edge of the plinth. And it's no longer just a, a thing in an imaginary space, but it's actually engaging with you. There's, it's building a bridge between imagination and reality. One of the things, obviously, that he was engaged with in the 1960s was the battle for abstraction, as he called it. He had to make a case, as he felt, for abstract sculpture. He had to argue his corner. It was the battle with figuration. He had to establish abstract sculpture as a, as a, as a genre that, that, that could hold its own in the world. But by the end of the 60s, he came, I think, to feel that the battle had been won. He no longer had to... Um, stick to that dogma, that, 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 that case he was making for abstraction. He could loosen up a bit and he's eventually, by the 80s, he said, I, could, I felt I, said, I could do anything, just bring it all in and, and relax a bit. And so in the later work, like with Magnolia Passage and so on, what you see is him re-engaging with the world. It's no longer pure abstraction. He's looking at the world and he's drawing it all in. And he's having a dialogue with a lot of different things. He, he likes objects, tables, chairs. And he, likes, he liked bits of architecture, walls, passageways, bridges, doors, steps. And he's entering a dialogue with these recognisable things. He plays with them. He deprives them of their functionality. And he exploits their expressive character. So you get a walkway that you can't walk on. But it has an identity that is visual and has an emotional message of his own. And he says it's for the eyes only. Tony was a modernist and a very innovatory sculptor, but he was also in some sense a romantic. He was very concerned with um, the imaginative, expressive identity of the things he was creating, and he wanted titles that would reflect some of that. And so he didn't give them numbers. He did at the start, but he abandoned that. And what he wanted to, to do was give you a way of engaging with the, the sculpture. And um, the titles are not descriptive because in effect, there's nothing to describe. The, 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 there is no recognizable subject, but he did want to evoke something. With the titles of the early sculptures like Midday or Early One Morning, or uh, Lock, or uh, Month of May. What he's, he's doing there is giving you the feeling. It's the feeling of the month of May, or it's the time of year, the seasons. Um, it's the time of day, early one morning, a walk 
in the freshness of the early morning. That's the feeling of the sculpture that he's alerting you to. A lot of the sculptures allude to music, like Nocturne and Oratorio and, and so on. And that's another part of Tony's work. He's again alerting you to the feeling of the sculpture, the nocturne, something to do with the night, something to do with a Chopin simple melody. He's telling you something about the small, intimate structure, the character of the work. But beyond that, it also, uh, in those works, um, refers to the musicality of his work. And he was quite explicit about this. He said, I would like to construct my work like a melody, adding shapes which are like a series of expressive gestures. And as you walk around the work, it unfolds in time like a lyrical melody.